Tessu.
Good morning, family. This is the day that the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Reverend Judalon Wortham, and I am an adopted daughter of the Kennedy Labatt clan. Keep Your Head to the Sky is an appropriate entry song because it's a metaphorical expression that encourages people to be optimistic and have hope for the future. Keep Your Head to the Sky is an appropriate entry song because Fabian loved music and he loved him some earth, wind, and fire. Why are we here today? We are here to celebrate. We are here to celebrate. We are here to celebrate the life of Fabian Labat. If you are able, won't you join me in a standing ovation for the person that we adore, Fabian Labat? Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. We are witnessing a miracle gathering today. How did this miracle gathering come about? I'm so glad you asked. Back in the day, Fabian's parents were best friends with Jaleesa's parents in D.C., and then both families relocated to Cali. The Labats and the Shepherds have such a legacy, there should be a book written, somebody, about how they lived their lives. Jaleesa is a few years older than Fabe. She was his babysitter when he was a little boy. They shared lots of adventures, my favorite one includes the time when Jaleesa had the nerve to let Fave sit in her lap and turn the steering wheel while she was driving her dad's car. They turned the corner and ran right into her mom and dad, and you know what? She was molded and grounded for a long time. Jaleesa, now married to Walt, one of their sons, Jalal, was headed to first grade. Jaleesa was unable to take him on the first day of school, so dad took him and met his teacher, Catherine. Later that day, Jaleesa asked Walt about the teacher, and Walt said that not only did she have the best bulletin boards that he had ever seen, but she was black and cute. <laughs> Jaleesa said, I must meet this woman, and the rest is history. BFFs forever. It turns out, however, that the heavenly connector himself Fred Kennedy already knew Walt from the frat basketball games. Who knew that the Kennedy-Hazard connection started before Jaleesa and Kath became BFFs? 
Jaleesa and Walt always invited Kath to be a part of their family vacations. Every summer, they went to the mountains and their bond increased. There was one particular moment, this is my favorite one, when the Hazards went to the High Sierras and Kath decided to make a scary leap thousands of feet up in the mountains. When he knew that Kath was safe, Walt said to his wife, find that girl a husband. <laughs> After a few attempts to introduce her to her Prince Charming, Jaleesa introduced Kath to Fabian. It's my understanding, now I'm not sure, that on the first real date, a football game, Fabian caught Kath reading a book. For those of us who know, well, our girl was doing what she does all the time, reading, any place, anywhere, anytime. And the rest is history. Three decades and some change, here we are. I remember Kath and Fabian's wedding like it was yesterday. I remember the birth of Fabian like it was yesterday. I remember the birth of Alexandra like it was yesterday. I was honored to do the get ready to be married sessions for Fabe and Whitney, and now we have Roman and Caden. And cause my name is Bennett and I'm not in it, we might have additional grands, I'm just saying. <laughs> this family is so amazing. Fabian loved being a super husband, a super dad, and a super grandfather. You could always count on Fabian being witty, inviting, loving, warm, and available. Fabian was a man's man. Look around and see how many brothers are in the room. That shows you how loved Fabian was. I can hear Fabe saying to us, yes, I know this is crazy. Yes, this was not expected. Yes, I know everybody here is in shock. But he's saying to us, I need y'all to know, you gave me the will to be free. Purpose to live is reality. Hey, and I found myself never alone. Chances came to make me strong. To step right up and be a man, because you need faith to understand. So we're saying for you to hear, keep your head and face atmosphere. Keep your head to the sky so the clouds can tell you why. Keep your head to the sky so they can tell you why, Lord. Keep your head to the sky. Don't walk around with your head hung down, Kath, Fabe, and Alex. Surely the clouds are going to tell you why. Fabe, I love you. We love you. Go Raiders. We will follow the program as it is listed. Please come up to the pulpit when it's your turn to share. So now we will hear another of Fabe's favorite songs, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, sung by Rose Rochelle.
that you dare to dream really do come true someday i'll wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me where colors melt like lemon drops away upon the chimney tops that's where Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. One of the character traits that we all would agree on with Faye was he was loving and he was kind. So it's only appropriate to share in this reading about love. 1 Corinthians 13 is a letter written by Paul that discusses the importance of love and how it is a way of thinking, acting, living, and being. The letter is set in Corinth and it's part of a conversation about spiritual gifts. Paul describes love as countercultural to the Corinthian Christians' pride, envy, and self-centeredness. 
He also says that love is Christ-like and based on the love of God poured out by the Holy Spirit, imitating Christ's love and the law written on the hearts of all Corinthians. This comes from 1 Corinthians, the, first, the 13th chapter. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trust God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. Inspired speech will be over someday. Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit. We know only a portion of the truth, and what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arrives, our incompletes will be canceled. When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I, gur I gurgled and cooed like an infant. When I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. We don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then, see it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly just as he knows us. But for right now, until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us toward that consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly, and the best of these three is love. Amen. I'd like to invite now those folk who are coming up to share whatever's on their heart about Fabian. And I know you have instructions, but I just want to remind you to keep it short as we wait for Fabe to do the actual eulogy. So, Daryl. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Darrell West. I am Fabian's cousin. Um, it's by definition, I've known Fabian my entire life. Um, but our relationship, I think, when I think about our lives, really began when I was 10 years old. And my family took a trip from New York to California. And this is the summer of 74. And we went from L.A. up to Oakland and stayed with Doc Fabe and Norma and Fabe and Norman at their beautiful house in Oakland in the hills that overlooked the city. And that's really kind of the beginning of our relationship. Um, there was a huge age gap at that time. He's 17, I'm 10. And it's kind of difficult for kids that age to, to really to match. But um, we still did a lot. We played basketball. We played ping pong, we played games and so forth. But the biggest incident that I think of that, that kind of kickstarted our relationship was we went to a baseball game. And this was the Oakland A's back in 74 when they were a, a dynasty. Uh, it was no ordinary game. The A's were playing the Cleveland Indians and the Indians had a pitcher named Gaylord Perry. And if you remember Gaylord Perry, he was the master of the spitball. He was somebody who did things with the ball that no one else can do. And believe it or not, he was actually had won 15 straight games for the Indians and was one short of the major league record. And he's going against the A's and going against Northern Vita Blue. Um, 
The stadium, as I recall, was electric. It was a, a playoff atmosphere in July. Um, packed capacity, exciting game, went down to ninth inning, and the A's pulled it out, won, actually in the 10th inning, won four to three, beat, Paylor, beat uh, Gaylord Perry, and ended his streak. And I remember when I was at the game, just with Fabian, my, my older, bigger cousin, the excitement that he had, the, the passion that he had for his team. And that's something which kind of stuck with me. My eyes are wide open. Um, I'm a 10-year-old skinny, scrawny guy, and I'm watching my big cousin just get involved and love his team. And that kind of kick-started our relationship. And over the next 10, 15 years or so, we spent more and more time together. And by the time I was 20, we were friends. You know, the, the age gap narrowed to nothing. Um, over the years, we went our ways. Um, you know, I, eventually I moved to California because of Fabian and adopted what I consider my West Coast family um, because of Fabian. And eventually, you know, life had us going different places. And although we didn't see each other physically during that period, we spoke. We spoke regularly. And our, our topics range from sports to politics to whatever. But whenever we spoke, no matter what, what consistently came out from Fabian was his love for his family. And that was spoken over and over again. We, you know, tend to not do a good job, and myself included, of, of telling the people who we love the most, how important they are in our lives. And, and as a result, I don't know, it's, we're wired that way, but we just don't do it, and if we do it, we don't do it enough. And that's exactly what I experienced with Fabian over those 10 years, was he felt comfortable talking to me about how he felt about his family. Catherine, Fabian loved you so much. He told me, often and often, just how important you were to his life. You were a crutch, a pillar, the foundation of his life. He, he couldn't imagine being where he was without you. And he told me that often, over and over again. We talked. And what he, what he expressed to me was an appreciation to you for what you've done for him. Alexandra, Fabian, I know you know that your daddy loved you, and that's clear. What you might not know or appreciate is how proud he was of you. Okay? When he spoke about you, he couldn't hide the pride. He couldn't hide the excitement. It just came out all the time, and he spoke about you all the time. He was proud of you, who you are as people, as persons, the quality that you have as individuals, your character, your moral compass. He talked about it all the time to me. You brought him so much joy, and you were the center of his life. I remember when he was going to move to from Virginia, when Catherine Faye moved from Virginia to, to LA a couple years ago, he was so excited to do that. And the reason why he was excited was because he was going to be around you two. Right? And that's really what it was. You were the center of his life. And everything about you was what made him happy. He struggled. He struggled with health challenges for the latter part of his life. But what gave him inspiration was being around you two. And that really was what Fabian was about. If you want to define Fabian, you just say one word, family. Because family was what defined him, what made him who he is. Um, our brother Fabian, he, uh, he left us too soon. And, and I miss him a lot. But he also left us a legacy, something to be proud of. Uh, he left us with good memories that'll make us smile, laugh, uh, shed some tears. 
Um, but I feel blessed that he was a part of my life. Thank you. Uh, his family, Daryl. Good morning. My name is Yamaya Pitts, and I'm the wife of Daryl Pitts and the sister-in-law of Gerald Pitts. I'm going to read for you something Daryl wrote on behalf of Daryl and Gerald. Hey now, was how Fabian greeted me for 50 years when we spoke on the phone or in person. It was always followed by at least a 30-minute conversation, even while we were working. It was an opportunity to check in and tell each other jokes. There were some occasions where we spoke for hours. We did it until he passed. We spoke three times on the day before he had his surgery, laughing and telling jokes. We had made plans for me to come see him in April. We ended our conversation that day laughing and joking. I'm sad that we won't make that meeting. We shared so many of life's experiences. It's hard to put a lifetime in a few words. I can't believe that you're gone. You were such a special person in my life, and I will cherish all the numerous memories and good times we had. We met when we were 16 and became great friends at Cal Berkeley. We had big afros, leather coats, blue jeans, knick-knick shirts, and members-only jackets. I drove a Chevy Monte Carlo, and he drove a Pontiac Firebird. The facial hair started about that time, too. The smooth baby faces gave way to mustaches, goatees, and eventually beards. <laughs> it was our time for Marvin Gaye, Rick James, and Earth, Wind, and Fire. The world was ours, and we experienced the many changes together. I had multiple nicknames for Fabian, Fabes, the bopper for his long drives on the golf course, Twain, a name my mother gave him because she couldn't read his handwriting when he was spelling his name. It was their little joke. Consigliere from The Godfather, and my personal favorite, F Flava Flav, Dave, <laughs> referring to the group Public Enemy. One of my other favorite nicknames was Dad, which stemmed from a night out in D.C., Fabian and Catherine and I went out to dinner, and after we get to, to the restaurant, Catherine went to the ladies' room, and while she was in there, a lady asked her if she and Fabian were out for dinner with their son, referring to <laughs> <laughs> When Catherine came back to the table, she was giggling and told us what the lady said. Fabian looked at me with that look he always gave and said very nicely. Go get the car for your mother and me, and as he passed the keys to me. <laughs> I fell out laughing, and I never let him forget about that night. It was hilarious. My brother Gerald, Fabian, and I did everything together. We were thick as thieves. We became fraternity brothers in Kappa Alpha Psi, and we gave a lot of parties. We called ourselves Roses because we gave out roses at the parties to attract the ladies. <laughs> We would always sell out the place. We made quite a bit of money giving these parties. We were college kids with money in our pockets, marketing 101 at its finest. We even turned his parents' house into a party spot, and we held a few bachelor parties there also. <laughs> Somehow, Fabian always managed to get Dr. Labat away from the house on those nights so we could have a good time. He was my consigliere. We were fraternity brothers. We were in each other's weddings and we were family. He was always fair and trustworthy. He always had me look at both sides of an issue. There was always time to discuss life and the issues of the day. There was a lot of wisdom and love in Fabian. He could always adapt to a situation, and he never seemed to panic. I will miss his advice, humor, and keen wit. He was a good man who loved his family, and he was so proud of Alexandra and Fabian. 
He loved his daughter-in-law, Whitney, and his grandsons, Roman and Caden, but above all, he loved Catherine. He said this to me all the time. God bless you, Catherine, Fabian, Alexandra, and the rest of the family and friends. Fabian left a wonderful legacy here on earth and will never forget you. I know the elders greeted him with open arms when he arrived. Rest well, my dear brother. I love you, Fabian. Hey, now. Good morning, folks. Uh, my name's Reed Bessinger. It's an honor to be here, and I do take pleasure in telling you what Fabian meant to me and to my family, but I'm in a race. It's already started. So I'm going to do what I can, and I'm going to walk off when I can't go any further. Uh, well, shoot. I'm going to start off with the obvious thing. I am so lucky to have had Fabian in my life for five minutes, much less the 20 years that I enjoyed having him as a great friend, a mentor, a smart alecky son of a gun that'll come in and condense the nonsense anytime those good ideas in my head found voice so that he could see them and provide some feedback to me. And you know, that's friendship. But it's more than that. I think as men in America, we're handicapped. At least I am. Um, we have an ideal of manhood that's stoic, strong, silent, problem solver. Not, not someone experiencing a problem, someone who solves problems. Fabian made all that okay. If you want to be that, that's fine. But at the same time, when it gets too much, man... Talk. Talk about it. Because if you don't, you're going to end up in a tower somewhere with a rifle doing bad things to people who got nothing to do with your situation. He was a voice of reason in my life. And he still is. In the last week and a half, I quit counting. I quit counting last Thursday a number of times I heard Fabian in my head going, man, I don't believe I'd have done that. <laughs> Has he said that to me before? Yes. Many times. But every time he says that in my head, it's appropriate for the moment because he knows what I was thinking. Um, he felt it. He makes a difference now. And so that's all good. Um, how did we connect? Oh, I met him at a party. Sitting in the backyard. Kids playing in every direction. And he wanted to talk to me about baseball. And that was a shame, because that's like trying to sow seeds on barren soil with me. I didn't grow up with baseball in my life. Having said that, as you all know, once I got to know Fabian, I learned a lot about baseball. <laughs> to the good. Uh, I thought it was like watching paint dry when I was a kid. Now I realize, man, there's subtlety going on. There's, there's knowledge. There's beauty. There's artistry happening. I wouldn't have seen that without him, without his patience. But then he wanted to talk about two things that made it easy, comedy and music. Comedy and music. We talked in detail about the wit of Clemens and Rogers and Pryor and, I mean, let's just go ahead, Burr, Chappelle, Key, Peel, the greats, the things that bring a smile to your day. Even if it's just him calling me up, repeating a quotation of something we just watched together, and it takes me 30 minutes to get it out of my head. Those are all great things. That's not the point. For me, the point is, when I try to distill it down, what Fabian brought to me was love. 
love. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Rashid Hazard, and um, I'm speaking on behalf of not only myself, but the rest of the Hazard clan. Um, so excuse me for the length of my remarks, please. Um, but with a man like Fabian, um, who's been in my life since I can remember, there's just so much to say. And um, it would be a disservice if we didn't share some of that right now. So please bear with me. <clears throat> the Hazard Shepherd Labot connection. Um, as Judy explained, Fabian's parents, Doc Fabe and Gladys, along with my mom and my aunt Tracy's uh, parents, Big Pat and Grandma Jean, became friends during their time living in Washington, D.C. Later, they all relocated to California with the other D.C. transplants and professionals where they had a very active life together. They developed an unbreakable bond through card games, social club trips, and lots of parties. My mom and Aunt Tracy knew the Labatt boys from birth, with my mom being a babysitter for Fabian, and we've all heard from Judy's story how much of an adventure that was. Um, and so she has to accept, for everybody who's been in a car with Fabian on the freeway when he was cut off, she's going to have to accept some responsibility for those reactions. <clears throat> so she's his unofficial driving instructor. Um, but then there's me and my brothers, the, the Hazard Boys, as Fabian would refer to us. Uh, we were so fortunate to have him in our lives as far back as we can remember. Um, I'm a little jealous of my oldest brother, Yakub, because he was of adult age when we took those trips to the uh, Sierra Mountains. And he got to drink uh, Zimbabwe's with my dad and Fabian and my mom and Catherine. And for those of you who don't know what a Zimbabwe was, if you, if you know Fabian and you know my dad, you know that two black men aren't going to drink a kamikaze. They're going to rename it, and they're going to call it a Zimbabwe. <laughs> so that's where that name came from. Um, and when I got to college, I actually did get, I, I actually made Fabian make me a Zimbabwe one night when I came out there, because I shouldn't tell you guys this, but Catherine used to wash my clothes and make me food while I was playing ball at GW. <clears throat> um, my brother Jalal, he gets all the credit for the Kennedy Labatt Union, as Judy already explained. Um, if it wasn't for him going to Kelso Elementary, we wouldn't have Catherine in our lives. and. Um, Catherine and Fabian would have never come together. And so we wouldn't have my little sister Alexandra and my little brother Fabian. Um, there's another story I'd like to tell about a time in New Orleans, um, but Krishna, don't worry, we won't, we won't tell that story in here today. <clears throat> um, my brother Khalil um, sent me two stories that he had about Fabian. He says, I remember going to Oakland to see Grandma Jean and Big Pat, and I had an E.T. Michael Jackson storybook on vinyl that someone gave me as a present. Fabian lived in Oakland at the time, and we would always go and hang with him during our trip. Fabian always had a state-of-the-art stereo component system because he was just fly. He had a Porsche and an incredible st uh, stereo system, which at the same time were the coolest things you could have in my book. I also always admired his taste in music. He loved music. Anyway, I was obsessed with this E.T. and Michael Jackson storybook slash vinyl, but I couldn't play it at my grandparents' house. Fabian was my only option to hear the vinyl. I just remember that I harassed Fabian to let me listen to it at his house. Plus, I also wanted him to make a cassette of it so we could listen to it in the car. Finally, Fabian agreed to do it, but wouldn't let me touch his stereo system. He was also busy, so I, couldn't, I could only listen to it when he had time. He told, me to leave, he, he told me to leave my vinyl with him, and he would make a cassette for me. Fabe hooked me up with the high-end cassette tape of my E.T. MJ record, which made me look at Fabe as a superhero. He was just the coolest. 
And so we'll give him some credit for some of the Grammys for inspiring Khalil and sharing in his stereo system with him as well. Um, Khalil always, also loved Calvin and Hobbes. Fabian and I had a bond with music, but we also had a bond for the Calvin and Hobbes comic strip. I used to read that in the newspaper comic section. Fabian would have all of the Calvin and Hobbes books at his house when we would visit them in Alameda. He would let me borrow them, and that became our thing when I would see him and Catherine. I would forget to bring them back to him from time to time, and he would always say, where's my Calvin and Hobbes book, Doc? It became a running joke even after we had outgrown our love for Calvin and Hobbes. I will always miss his sense of humor and kindness. He was a superhero. We grew up with so many. I will always be grateful for that. And for me, personally, you know, Big Faves was like my crazy uncle uh, slash godfather and slash, as we say, he was like the big homie. You could just hang out with him. You could always have a good time with Big Fade. And as my brother Khalil said, he was cool. My earliest memories of Big Fabes is him rolling up to my parents' house on Virginia Road in the Porsche 944 with the big shades. His beard game was always on point. And for some reason, I always remember him rocking the crew socks pulled right up to his calves. <laughs> it, I mean, it was the 80s, and I think that was fly back then. All right? And he was strong. I mean, Fabe, as you say, you guys say he was a man's man. He was strong. So, of course, me being who I am, when I first met Big Fabe, I looked him right in his eyes, and right before I ascended his back, I told him, you're my jungle gym. And then I proceeded to climb all over him. Um, Big Fabe would let me climb him, punch him, try to tackle him. Then it would turn into a, into a wrestling match that I would inevitably lose. Sometimes he would even let me get the upper hand for a hot second, but later I realized he was just making me feel like I was tough before he humbled me. Then, just as I thought I was about to get my first W, Big Fade would throw me over his shoulder like a rag doll or pin me in some ungodly way where I couldn't move, then say, not yet, little fella, but you know what he said. Um, we're in church and there's kids here, so we're going to edit our language this morning, okay? Since I was seven or eight, that was our little inside joke. Every time I'd see Big Fave, Big Fave, I'd give him a big hug. Then right after, we would lean into each other, kind of shoulder to shoulder like we were about to fight in elementary school. And I would look at him again and say, you're my jungle gym. Then we would wrestle until he decided to squash me then once again say, not yet, little fella, but you know the language. When I was a senior in high school, we were at his house in Alameda, at Catherine and Fabe's house in Alameda during the North, uh, Northridge earthquake. And of course, at some point, our paths crossed. We did our little ring around and rosy routine. Then we locked horns. And this time it was a different reaction because I was growing up. We locked horns, and he looked at me, and he said, oh, shoot. But you know what he said. <laughs> it was then that he had the realization that I was coming into my own physically, and he threw his hands up, and he said, you got it. And from that day forward, whenever we greeted each other, I would pull him close and whisper, you're still my jungle gym. Then we reconnected on the East Coast when Kath, Fabe, my little brother, Little Fabe, and Alexandra moved, and I was going to uh, George Washington to play basketball. We had some great times on the East Coast. I love hanging out at the house with Big Fabe, Kath, Lil' Fabe, Alexandra. Me and Big Fabe would watch Monday night football, NBA games. If you lived on the East Coast, you know they come on at damn near midnight. So that's when we had our Zimbabwe. And whenever I stayed over late, we would watch Martin, or Saturday Night Live, or one of his old favorites in Living Color reruns on VHS. And Big Faye would cry laughing whenever he saw Brub Man from the fifth floor. And I got more than my share of Brub Man head nods when he came to the house 
or whenever he came to my games at GW. And then there was the time we watched Homie the Clown. And then the next time I came over, he had his very own sock club prepared to hit people with. As he said, homie, don't play that. <laughs> as far as I know, he never used it, but with Big Fabe, you never know. Um, Big Fabe used to come to most of my games. He was not a big fan of my coach. And as I'm sure you guys can imagine, he let him know in the most Big Fabe way possible. He decided Mike Jarvis was a real-life leprechaun. But of course, it didn't stop there. Every time Jarvis came within earshot or came up in discussion, Big Fabe would shout in a crazy Irish accent, I'll teach you to steal me gold. His accent was horrible, but everybody knows Big Fabe's sense of humor. But then there was the adventures from D.C. to Virginia during rush hour on a Friday after Big Fabe just finished a full day of work. I won't get into the gory details, but I'll summarize one story. We were approaching the Springfield Mall exit, uh, which is where they lived in Virginia. But some genius decided it was a good idea to cut off Big Fabe, then flip him the bird. Um, I'll save the, what happened directly after that, but I'll just say this. By the time we got to Tyson's Corner, I was laughing so hard, I almost peed my pants. For my LA people who don't understand the distance that we drove, that's the equivalent of about to exit at Crenshaw, somebody flips you the bird and you follow them to the 405 exchange on the 10, okay? Just so you can have a visual. Big Fabe gave the other driver a couple of pieces of his mind all the way to Tyson's corner. Although he heard none of it, as he was too busy trying to get away from us, then all of a sudden, he just stopped. We got off the freeway. He turned around and headed back to the house, and it was over. And then he looked at me, and I hadn't stopped laughing since he started chasing this guy. And he just cracked up, and we laughed together all the way back to the house. You know, like Reed said, and Daryl and Gerald, you know, Fabe gave the, he gave the best advice. And I'm going to use some advice that he gave me. Um, when he saw the pain I was in after my brother Jalal passed. And, you know, another thing uh, Fabe and I shared was temperament and an ability to uh, ascend to anger uh, when necessary. And one of the things that he told me that was really important and that I've held on to was to focus on life, not loss. And that really resonated with me. And, um, you know, when... Fabe called me um, that morning about a week, or, a week ago, and I had to take that drive out to, um, to be with him and Catherine. Um, that's what I chose to focus on, was life, not loss. Um, and so I think when we leave here today, let's make sure that we love each other, that we continue to hug each other, and that we continue to lift each other up, and let's focus on life and not loss. Thank you. Well, in uh, seven minutes, it's going to be official for me to say good afternoon. So we'll say good morning and good afternoon. My name is Karen Kennedy. The bond that I shared with Fabian is Catherine Rose Hale Kennedy Labatt. And it is a tremendous experience to go through life with a brother named Fabian Albion Labatt III. I knew Fabian Albion Labatt II, Doc Fabes, like most of, many of you did. And as my niece Alexandra likes to say, apple tree. Um, knowing Fabian Labatt IV, apple, apple tree, tree. <laughs> and it looks like Roman Labatt is going to be apple, 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 tree, tree, tree. 
And that's a good thing. That's a great thing. Because one of the thing, one of the um, experiences I'm having this morning is how lucky we all are. We are so fortunate to have the family that sits within these walls and outside of these walls, all the family that's watching on streaming or just being in this, in this space with us. We are so fortunate. Most people don't have this. Most people can't get up and talk about someone extemporaneously and everyone mentions the same things about family and love and caring. And all of that comes with this emotional intelligence that Fabian shared with so many people, with all of his ancestors, with his brother Norman, with his kids. So I want us to sort of really pat ourselves on the back that we made a good choice to be friends with Fabian. <laughs> we didn't have to be. <laughs> There's two things I, I, I want to say. I had written down some stuff, but that stuff goes out the window, right? I remember the first day I met Fabian, and I was at Jaleesa's house, and the back door opens, because that's the way everyone came in, if you were family. You only rang the doorbell if you didn't know them. Back door bursts open, Fabian comes in, and he's like, hey! And he's just grinning, and great smile, and bubbly, I'm like, well, who's this guy? I haven't met him. He had just driven down from um, Oakland for some, some reason. And Julie's like, oh, Fabian, great. This is Fabian. He's like, okay, that's cool. And for some reason, um, we're outside. He wants to show off his car, the Porsche that, that um, Rashid mentioned. Although I think it was a 914, and the reason why I say that because I looked it up in the little Porsche classic car, and it looked like that. So I think it was actually a 914. But I remember, I was like, oh, wow, this is sort of impressive. That's nice, nice car. And then he opened it up, and it had this, like, black and silver houndstooth custom interior. And I thought, wow, that's a little, you know, why would you do that to such an expensive car? But that was the clue as to who Fabian was. He was just bleeding raiders inside and out and in his car. So I... You know, I, I was like hip to that. Um, later on when Catherine and Fabian started dating, she didn't have a clue. She had no idea what that silver and gray man, silver and black man, she didn't know what the Raiders were. I think she may have because it, she read the paper from the beginning to the end, so she did cover the sports page. But as you all know, Catherine would go on her dates with books, and the the day that they came to tell me that they were engaged, I, I was in the back room in the duplex that Catherine and I used to share, and they came in, they said, oh, we've got something to tell you. And they said, we're getting, you know, we're going to get married. And I was so excited, I started jumping up and down. I mean, it's just, and that's not what I do, but I just started jumping up and down because I was so excited. I was going to have a brother-in-law. I didn't really know what that meant, but I was going to have a brother-in-law. And I thought, wow, this man is pretty committed because he had gone on all those dates with Catherine with the book. <laughs> and book meaning plural. But he, he, he made that leap. And together, they had the most fun house, the most loving house, the most crazy house. Um, and I was always welcome there. Even though I know Fabian would talk about me when I left, I felt like I'd come back. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Alexander saying, yeah, that's true. Uh, is <laughs> but that was the specialness of what the Labatt family really specializes in. And when I say the Labatt family, I mean Norman, I mean Doc Fabes, I mean Fabian, Lil Fabes, Alexandra. All of these, David Labatt, 
his cousin, they always walk in with a warm embrace and they make you feel like you are there for, to share in a special moment. And so I just want to give thanks to this group of people who are here, who are able to experience that Labat love and who will continue to share that Labat love not just in Fabian's name, but in our name, because that's what counts the most. Hey everyone, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Fabian Labot IV. Um, I'm gonna read because I'm gonna you know, try and get through everything. Uh, I was debating how much I even wanted to get up here and talk about you know, how much I would realistically be able to get through, um, how much I even wanted to share. Um, but then I figured I'd do it in the way he did, and it's telling stories. All right, so that's what I'm gonna kinda do today. Um, and at first, Rashid was being coy. My dad was definitely an aggressive driver. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I got a little bit of it, uh, I'm not gonna lie. But you know, he would have been the, the poster child for road rage back in the day if they had one, for sure. For sure. Um, I spent a lot of time reminiscing, you know, stories to tell about my dad, and there were definitely a few consistent themes. Um, and I laughed and cried in each one of them and that I realized they couldn't be told in the church setting. Um, so there, there were, you know, definitely PG moments, car trips up and down the East Coast to visit, you know, our, our cousins in New York and New Jersey, always great times. Um, my sister and I in the back seat saying, are we there yet? Uh, which I'm sure drove him crazy, and now I understand. Thank you, Roman, um, for that. <laughs> uh, you know, neighborhood, water balloon fights with the kids, my dad reliving, you know, his baseball days that everyone keeps talking about, uh, you know, going out there and throwing, you know, water balloons as hard as possible at kids, you know, that's what he lived for, you know, but it was, it was a lot of fun, right? And in the early 2000s, my dad and I, we bonded over comedy for years, and, and I mean for years, he tried to get me to watch Fear of a Black Hat. Um, he, he thought it was the funniest thing at the time. I think he hyped it up so much that I just, it fell flat for me. Um, <laughs> And I think I heard his feelings with that, but he came back around and he tried to get him a boomerang and he succeeded, that was, that was a good one. But my favorite comedian is Dave Chappelle. And so I got him hooked on watching the Chappelle show with me every week. And at the time, Lil John had a bunch of hit songs, um, catchy ad libs, you know, so Chappelle did a skit of him. My dad thought it would be funny to scream those ad libs at my basketball game. And so he would do it at every question McCall. And if you've ever been to a high school basketball game, there are a lot of those. So uh, in the moment, it was, it was really embarrassing like, to hear your dad you know, standing at the top of the stands just screaming, what? Like <laughs> mimicking little John in this, in this small arena. Um, you know, you can always hear that one voice when you're out there. And it was my dad. Everyone knew it was my dad. But as I got older, what I realized is that it was him displaying his pride and proving that he was ready to ride for me and with me on anything. And, you know, it's the same characteristic that everyone has come up here and talked about today. His compassion, his love, his humor, it's all rolled into one. He always thought he was the funniest person in the room. Um, <laughs> I admire that confidence and, you know, reflect on how he instilled that in my sister and I. You know, I've logged on to Facebook more times, like, in these past 10 days than I have in 10 years, and it was, you know, to feel connected to my dad, to just read everything, to see what he would post and all that. Like, I know it was his favorite app on his phone, um, but, like, reading all the comments, everyone talked about his sense of humor. Everyone did. Um, like, Facebook was truly meant for him. I feel like even, you know, the last post that he put was about one of his famous memes about Trump. 
I can't repeat it, but um, I would urge everyone to go look it up to get a laugh. I can tell you it was on brand for him, though, for sure. You know, I spent hours just, you know, scrolling through everything, don't, looking at pictures, crying, laughing. Um, right. I can't say everything, but there were a few that I'm going to read off here that I feel like are appropriate to do in this church. Um, so no particular order. The first one, I think it's so unfair that I have to manage my anger just because people can't manage their stupidity. <laughs> I, I feel them on that every day, yeah. As I, grow, as I grow older, I've learned that pleasing everyone is impossible, but pissing everyone off is a piece of cake. <laughs> also my dad. Never blame someone else for the road you're on. That's your own ass fault. <laughs> and then lastly, nobody's more stubborn than an Android person that won't switch to iPhone. Trying to look at his phone this week has been impossible. I don't know how he did it. I don't know. But, you know, it pretty much sums up his characteristics. Witty, stubborn, impatient, and loving. They were passed on to my sister and I. You all can guess who got which characteristic. <laughs> but, yeah, he was stubborn. He was, he was stubborn for sure. Um, back in 2017, I was working at Fox Sports. At the time, I got tickets to the World Series. My dad was in town, um, and it was the Astros versus the Dodgers at Dodger Stadium. He definitely wanted to go, but I could tell he was torn. At the time, he loved the Giants, so you know it meant he hated the Dodgers. Um, and he didn't respect the Astros because he believed that they were a National League team. If you've ever been to Dodger Stadium, it's very historical, but it's huge and has a lot of stairs. So again, this is 2017 before uh, my dad's surgery. Um, our seats were behind home plate, but they were up a few levels. So not only did my dad refuse to bring the handicap past the park, he also refused to take an elevator. Eventually, I flagged one of the ADA carts and, you know, asked us to get, you know, back to the car, because otherwise, you know, we were trying to go home that night. But <laughs> as we sat in the parking lot for an hour trying to get out, he told me about all the games he remembered going to his dad and brother at the Oakland Coliseum. And just, you know, seeing the joy on his face telling those stories was, was great. You know, I know he didn't physically visit Oakland often, but Oakland ran through his blood, you know, through and through. Nope. <laughs> so a few weeks ago when my dad, uh, you know, originally fell, I called up the twins and I asked Daryl to call up his boy and light a fire under him for physical therapy and to tell him what I wanted to, but I couldn't out of respect. Um, again, I'm the fourth, so the choice of explicit words, you know, flows through me as well. Just, it's natural. But Dale replied, I got you. I already told him I was coming next week to change his diaper. <laughs> Gonna miss him. You know, I'm going to miss him calling me after every single trip I had just to check in, whether it was one day, one week, wanting to know how it went. I'm going to miss him telling me the same story over and over like it was the first time I heard it. <laughs> I'm going to miss him sending me random Facebook video links. I'm going to miss walking into the house and hearing him watching videos so loud that he didn't even know I walked in. Well, thank you, Uncle Michael, for doing that the other day. That, that was helpful. Um, no, I, I can't stand here and, and lie to y'all and say that I don't think about the shoulda, coulda, woulda. Um, you know, I know I'm not supposed to, but it's, it's hard right now. All right? It's really hard. Um, but, you know, I look around this room, and I see everyone who came from all over the state, all over the country, and how much, you know, he meant to everyone, and so I just find comfort in that. So I really appreciate, you know, seeing everyone's face here today. Um, I'm, I'm gonna honor my and remember my dad for the witty, sarcastic, genuine, caring man that he was, and encourage you all to do the same. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, my name is Norman. I miss my uh, I miss my big brother, but uh, seeing all of you here is, is uh, it really warms my heart and makes me feel okay. I'm gonna read something that I know was important to Fabian, important to me. It's called the Serenity Prayer. So if you want to uh, join on, feel free. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking as he did this sin sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen. Thank you. As we prepare to leave this part of the celebration, I will ask that you follow the instructions from David Labat, who's gonna lead us out in second lining down to the Fellowship Hall. We're gonna start part two of the celebration. So RJ, can you play that song, please? Everyone get your hankies out. We're going to start from right here. I'll start the line after David. Get up and get ready. Thank you. 